Well, thank you for uh, having me here today. Uh, this is my second time at a, uh, a conference here for uh, e-commerce Brazil, and uh, I really enjoy uh, my, my last visit here, so when they asked me to come and speak again this year, uh, I was really looking forward to it. What they wanted me to speak on today was innovation, and what I do at Target is run an innovation team focused on digital marketing. And the topic uh, of innovation, I, I've been to many topic uh, discussions on it where people talk about innovation is great, you need it. We all know that. What most people don't realize is innovation is actually very hard. It has a lot of pitfalls to it. And there's a lot of things that people just don't tell you up front that you're going to run into are, are challenges. So that's what I really wanted to focus on today was help you navigate through that situation, particularly if you're at an established company, it adds in a different mix to the problems that you have because you're already in an organization that has a culture that you're trying to change. So a bit about me, uh, as discussed, you know, I do work at Target, been at Best Buy. Some of the products I've innovated, in two years they've already passed the 100 million. I've got one that after four years is uh, generating a billion dollars in revenue per year. So I, I've had the track record of, of understanding what happens when you try and innovate and seeing where that takes you. But first, we've got to establish what is innovation. So for most people, innovation, we're trying to go somewhere we've never been before, and we're trying to look through the eyes of the customer. Now, when I say the eyes of the customer, I don't necessarily mean saying we're, we're trying to take their perspective on the shopping experience, but we're trying to relate to the shopping experience through their situation. What are their joys? What are their pains when it comes to dealing with our, our organization? How do we change that experience? It, it, also, it comes down to changing how we've done things in the past to reinventing them to the new. So it's like Henry Ford said, if he had asked people what they wanted back when he first created the Model T, they would have said, a faster horse. Your customers can't always articulate what they want in a, in a way that will translate into a product directly. Oftentimes, you're going to have to do that for them. But getting to uh, what really is innovation, this painting here is a great representation of that. This represents the French Revolution. And innovation really is about, about revolution. And it brings with it the promises and the dark side of change. So the French Revolution, when it first started, it was a very promising and positive change for the people of France. They were living under a monarchy. They were generally poor and oppressed and didn't have any representation. The revolution gave voice to the people. The problem is the revolutionaries took things a bit too far. They went for the revolution for the sake of revolution, and they forgot the people, and that came the decade of terror that followed where many people died. Innovation within organizations often fall into that same, that same trap where people just want to innovate just to innovate and change without connecting it back to the experience of the customer. When that comes out of the equation, innovation goes from a success and a positive to something that can be a failure and a negative. And to uh, you know, stress that point a bit more, this picture here is actually of the same event taken almost a decade apart. It's when Pope Benedict and then Pope Francis were announced as the popes. So in 2005, you see like one guy with a smartphone. 2013, I can't see anybody without a digital device. Less than a decade has changed. And the way we interact with the world has changed radically. We have, uh, you know, what's generally considered one of my competitors here, Walmart. They have a booth here today. I, I truly respect them. And when I do my work, I don't consider myself competing against Walmart. What I'm trying to do is capture the attention and the time of all those people on that digital device. That's my competition. I need to figure out, how do I interact with people? How do I grab their time and attention on these devices that they give you so little time to begin with? That's really where I place my focus on. I don't necessarily look and see, well, what's Best Buy doing? 
what's, what's Walmart doing or Amazon's doing? They have different relations with their customers than, than I have. And I need to focus on what that relationship that I have with my customers. So we talked about revolution, but there's also evolution. Companies and their, their interactions with customers are changing. So we, we're seeing a lot of changes when it comes to how we create our products and what we have to focus on. For the past few years, and I've done this myself, it's all been about data-centric. Get as much data as you can. Understand your customer from the point of view of the data they're giving you. That's no longer good enough. It's really customer-centric. Instead of just looking at their data, you've got to look at their entirety. And oftentimes, this means getting outside of the data sets that you currently have. The next thing is silos. For a long time, people have been talking about mobile as a channel. Mobile's not a channel anymore. Mobile is becoming a tool that you use across channels. In the past, we used to have just the mobile channel, looked at the sales. I walk into the store, 25% of my customers are walking around with their phone. Mobile's not a channel. It's an augmentation tool for the in-store experience. Same thing with uh, specialists. We used to have things like, you know, the tablet team, the mobile team. We now have a digital team. Big picture, instead of looking at these individual slices, we have to look much broader. Linkage, it used to be all about, let's, let's link our data together, let's combine it. Let's put it all in one place. So we had vendors out there talking about data lakes, and we need to have these big resources of data ponds. It's all about sharing. It doesn't matter how much data you have, it's all about how much are you willing to share, because that's where the real value comes in. And we have to move away from linear thinking, where we tell a customer, your process to interact with us is step one, two, three, four. Well, as a customer, what if I want to go from step one to step four? That's what more customers are starting to say. Don't limit me to your, your path of a linear process. Allow me to choose and create a frictionless, frictionless experience to go across any path I'd like to. So now that we've kind of laid the, the groundwork around what is innovation, let's get into some of the, the approaches that we take. Uh, this is some research done on what are some of the priorities that executives have. You see that they're, they're pretty common things, you know, new products, better experience for existing customers, better experience for new customers. These are things that usually when talking to the CMO, CFO, these are the things they bring up. That's what they want to focus on. Here are some of the things that they complain about when they talk to us about innovation. Development time. If you're taking more than a year to develop something, chances are you're in trouble. Lack of coordination. Many times you'll see an innovation team just sort of pushed off in the corner. People are told, well, those are the innovation guys. They, they kind of do their thing. And then there's the rest of us. If you don't have coordination with the rest of the organization, then how do you know what you're building is going to become relevant? Same thing with the risk adverse and uh, limited customer insights. It all leads to poor idea selection. If, you, if you're constantly worried about what's going to happen to you, is this idea going to fail, then you're not going to succeed in doing innovation. You just have to get comfortable with living with risk. It just becomes part of the job. So going away from what the executives think about, going into what the teams actually experience. Having run these teams, I often see some of these issues come up. Uh, oftentimes, teams will run into ad adversity, particularly from other teams. So they'll try and play nice. They'll focus on conformity, forming familiar habits. These things, although you need some of that, you have to learn to balance that, not go to the extremes. Same thing with thinking without enthusiasm. Uh, I love hiring people straight out of college because they got tons of energy. Problem is they have very little experience. So there's lots of enthusiasm, but sometimes very little thinking that's happening. So there needs to be some, some balance there and temper that down. Same thing with lack of imagination. That's actually something I hire for is imagination. When I hire for people, I don't necessarily look for the technical skills so much. I look for their ability to think and their ability to, to go beyond the obvious and come up with their own solutions. 
It doesn't matter how old somebody is, as long as they can think and they love to learn. And self-discipline. You need to be able to get up in the morning and create your own schedule a lot of times. Because when we're building something completely new, I can't sit there and tell you, well, now that you've done this, you go on to this next step. We have to figure out what is that next step. So you need a lot of self-discipline. And the problem solving. This is a big one, the focusing on the tools, not the problems. Right now in the U.S., lots of people love talking about tools. Hadoop, Spark, Sandra, Aerospace, Aerospike. I like tools too. The problem is, oftentimes people will see a tool that they want to get into, play around with, and they'll come up with an excuse to spend budget on experimenting with the tool. Someone in my role has to step back and say, so how's this helping the customer? How's this helping the organization? Where's the value here? What can we do with this tool to actually achieve the goals that we're trying to solve? But as I do that, one of the things I also have to worry about is the rigidity. I can't be too tough on people. I can't uh, try and stifle them. But I also have to have good, good language skills to communicate to a developer or a data scientist or a linguist who speak very different languages. And I have to sit there and figure out, how do I translate to them so they're able to understand in the way that they see the world? Then uh, in the organizational blocks, uh, the big one there is too much belief in experts. Uh, back in Minneapolis, I'm considered a, a big data personalization expert, so people often come and talk to me about that. And then they'll ask me, well, how can we do this with logistics? Time out. I'm not a logistics expert. Oftentimes, organizations will see an expert and try and take value from them in areas where no value exists. So not relying on the expert's uh, belief outside of their exp experience is a big one that many organizations sometimes fail at. So on this slide here, what you're seeing is, on the left, a lot of companies that have innovation uh, teams and innovation labs. And on the right, all the consumers we're trying to reach. In the middle, you've got this huge gap. We're all trying to figure out how to scale. The nice thing is, we're all pretty much in the same situation here. Nobody's really figured this out. We all have the same problems. So that means, if you really think about it, nobody in this room is any worse off than anybody else when it comes to doing innovation, which in some ways is kind of comforting because you know you're not really that far behind. But in other ways, there's the challenge of realizing if this was easy, well, some of these guys would have been past this stage and have figured a lot of this out, but they're all suffering from the same problems. So how do you get around the, the problem and actually get to your customers? This is something that I actually use to discuss innovation when it comes to sharing it out, what my team does. It's two circles that have to interact with one another in terms of getting innovation to actually happen. The inner circle, let's start with learning. You need a team that loves to learn. If they don't want to learn, then they can't really help you grow. Because like I said before, you're having to create something out of nothing. And that means you have to spend a lot of time learning. A good part of our, our week is spent just learning about new tools, new ways and new insights about customers, and just seeing what's generally out there. The next thing is, uh, cultural change. We're part of a very large organization, and yet we're a small team. And we have to go out there and influence this organization of 100,000 people with 10 people on our team. You've got to change your own culture before you can change everybody else. So that means changing how we do things, becoming the example for other teams. And that's what we do. We, instead of following just one practice, we'll probably follow many at the same time show the success. Other teams come to us and then learn from us about how we, we can help them achieve similar results. New technologies. I spend probably 25% of my week just looking and evaluating new technologies, talking to vendors, playing around with open source tools. It's just a constant learning process. And then partnerships, both internally and externally within the organization. Going out there and learning who can I work with that's going to help me achieve what I can do. Because I only have 10 people on my team. So when I need to augment in an area, 
I go out and I partner. I don't actually have any linguists on my team. I just go to the, uh, the teams that do have them and say, I need this person for a couple months. Can you spare them? That helps me to, uh, to stay lean and quick. But just that inner circle alone is not good enough. When I go out and I explain to team leaders, uh, the executives at, at my company, what it is we're doing and how it's impactful, I have to go to the outer circle. They want to know, what are we doing that's relevant? How are we building trust with the customer? How are we able to scale it and make it profitable? And of course, conversion, how are we making money? So I can take that inner piece and then translate it to the outer piece, and that helps them understand the value that we're actually bringing to the organization. Now, when it comes to my team, when we're putting together our, our roadmaps, this is something that we actually work through as a process. We start out with ideation, and crazy ideas are completely acceptable here. This is the time to just throw anything out there and see what works, see what people are going to be passionate about. Then when you get to planning, then you can actually start looking at, well, what's really feasible? What can you really do with the resources you have, the budget you have? And then you want to get into production. Now, production is a great learning environment because once it's out there, you don't, just don't leave it alone. You've got to constantly test it, find the insights, see what you can actually gain out of that. We do an exercise we call chumming. So we go in the clickstream data and we create these... Uh, these clickstream paths that we do ourselves. And from that, we're able to look in the data and actually get insights because we knew what was the action happening at each point in time. Simple exercise, but you gain so much value out of that. And finally, scaling. That's where you need to be, is to be able to scale something to, uh, to reach what we call enterprise grade. So that means when holiday season comes around, it's not going to crash. That's what scaling for us means. And one of the things that we always focus on is just being unique, that has no value. You got to be unique and create value for the customer. Just by having something that's different has no value whatsoever. Now, this, this slide here, when I'm usually talking to other teams, this is how I'll break it down for them. So there's the strategy, processes, data, UX, and algorithms. Now, the interesting thing is four out of the five of these are interchangeable, you can actually put something else in there. But only one of them has to stay in, and that's UX. The experience around the customer, that's partially defined by the customer. We can't change it. I can change strategy, process, data, algorithms all day long. But because the customer now owns a big chunk of defining the experience, I can't touch that. I have to leave it in there. And if we understand, well, the customers have defined the experience this way, even though we think it should be this way, I have to respect the way the customers view the experience. Earlier, we saw that with uh, the eBay presentation, companies, they, ha they believe they're creating a great experience, but customers don't see that. We have to respect the fact that they aren't seeing what we think we're creating. And then we have to figure out how to close that gap. So building the team. Uh, when, when I'm running my team meetings, one of the things I, I like to do is be quiet. One of the things I've seen often over and over again is if the boss is the first one to talk, everyone else sits back and say, hey, boss, great idea, I love it. And if the boss is not open to other people's ideas, a lot of them will just sit back and say, why should I even bother because he won't listen to me anyways. So I always sit back, let the team talk, let them brainstorm. We do this every month where we have brainstorming sessions. Just get in a room with a bunch of whiteboards, you know, get some coffee, some soda, a bunch of sugary cookies, and we'll just talk about ideas. And I might start off by just asking questions, but really I let them do most of the talking. I might be doing all the whiteboarding, just writing things out while they chat. When you let your team do the talking, you find out that the ideas from the people that are on the ground tend to be much better than those of us that are spending a lot of our times just trying to sell the product. So let your team really do the talking, and if you're the boss, be quiet and let them do, let them do what you pay them to do, which is to innovate. So the other thing that I like to do is 
In the US, there's this big debate right now, product, UX, agile, which approach should you go with? Well, I don't subscribe to that. I think, why don't you just mix all three together? Because one approach on its own doesn't work. I come out of product management. That, that's where I got my training from. So I've always been a little biased to that. But I've got developers on my team that run in an agile environment, and I see the value there. And of course, the UX side has a lot of value too, because product and agile on their own are devoid of that human aspect that UX really brings into the picture. And any one of these processes on their own do not create innovation. If, if, you, if uh, Agile created innovation, anybody doing software development would basically be an innovation house right now. Same thing with anybody who's doing product management would be an innovation house. We know that's not true. You have to mix all of them together because they all have their strengths, but they all have glaring weaknesses too. So product. I come out of a manufacturing uh, environment and product. It's much more robust than what you see in software product development, which to me I basically translate into creating user stories, putting in a backlog, grooming it for your sprint. That's how most product managers in software work, whereas in manufacturing, you're really looking at it as a small business owner. I have to think about legal, compliance, promotion, sales, marketing, the product development cycle, all these different things that you usually don't see in the software product management house. So product management also tends to take a much longer view than the other disciplines do. So that's why it's good to have in there. Agile. There's aspects of Agile, particularly Scrum, that I like because it's very iterative. So we run on two-week cycles where we create different uh, aspects of our products every two weeks. And then we do a retrospective to understand what did we like about that, what didn't we like about it, how can we change it for the next time. I like that about uh, Agile. What I don't like about it is it's very short-term looking. So teams that are running purely on Agile, I ask them, what are you doing for holiday of this year? And they say, well, we're running an Agile shop here. We don't think that far out. Well, how can I collaborate with them if they're not thinking that far out? They're actually selling themselves short by not thinking long-term enough. And then uh, UX, or what often gets called design thinking. It brings that human aspect in that the other two oftentimes lack. Because at the end of the day, we're creating products for people not to show off technologies. And that's why I like having UX in there. It, it really does balance things out with uh, the other two disciplines. Because at the end of the day, I'm trying to elicit an emotional response with my innovation. If I can't get that response, because all I did was create a technology, then, then I failed. Now, coming into the, the actual team itself, when, when people think of innovation teams, these are the type of people that I often hear, you know, young, hip, kind of, you know, live hard, play hard type of people. I got a couple people like that on my team, but actually most of them look like uh, these guys. Middle age, older. I've got two guys that work for me that uh, the year I was born, they were in college. And that's not a bad thing. Uh, research has shown that uh, people over 50, at a rate of uh, at least two times, will make uh, more high-valued products than the under 34 crowd. People over 45, better understanding of the financial impacts of their decisions. You know, it makes sense. By the time you're 45, you've probably got a house, a car payment, kids. You understand about financial responsibility. The over 35 crowd, they've got lots of experience. I've got team members that come from aerospace. One guy was a pioneer in logistics software. Another guy, before we hired him, he was making uh, algorithms that do the, you know, those nanosecond trades for Wall Street. So they come from a very diverse background, and they've got the skill set that they can adjust fairly well. They, they have the experience where... I may have had to have hired three 20-something-year-olds. I got this one 60-year-old that can basically do all three jobs because he has the skills that 
The other thing I like is these older guys on my team, they're established where they live. They're not going to go to Silicon Valley and work for, for a company out there. They've been living in the same house for 20 years. They're happy where they are. Two of them could retire today if they wanted to, but they do the job because it's fun. It's mentally stimulating. They like the challenge. And even though they may have an age that's chronologically old, by most people's standard, their minds are young. They, they, want, to, they want to keep going. They want to be creative. So I always you know, challenge people and say, you may think of hiring somebody who's young, but don't, do, don't rule out people that are older. Again, if they, if they show that they're willing to learn, they, they like being challenged, they've got that, that fighting spirit to, to cha- go through any challenge, it doesn't matter how old somebody is, hire them. Now, the type of people that you want on your team can't all be the same. You're going to have to have different actors on your team. And this is something I, I've learned over time. So the first one you need is the revolutionary. You know, that's that person. They're part of the cause. They, they believe in it. Most of the time, these guys don't have the technical skills to actually make their ideas work. That's why you need the creator, a person that can take that idea and build it into something. But if you just have those two people around, you'll probably create uh, products in a vacuum. So you need the customer champion, somebody who always reminds you, we're building this for someone to use. And we need to make sure that what we build is going to be used by them in the way we'd hope they use it. But then you're going to need a troubleshooter. This is, again, where the older workers come in quite handy because they can get in there. When you hit that wall, which you eventually will hit, they'll be able to go in there, fix it, say, no problems, we got this moving again. Then you need the connector. That's, That's basically where I spend my time. I go out there, talk to different teams, figure out how do we expand our, our reach within the organization, figure out who, who do we need to connect with outside the organization to make things happen. And then when it comes to the idea creation, you're always looking at your choices, how things are changing, how does it impact the culture. And then implementation, your work's always got to be actionable, scalable, and repeatable. Because most of the products that we build, we're handing it off to another team once we've reached scale, and they maintain it. If I write something that's all in C++ code, and they have nobody who knows that language, that becomes useless for them because they can't repeat it. So I have to take that into account when we're we're building products. Then domain experts. You need to have different domain experts that do different things. So I break those down into three categories. Brokers. Again, this is sort of where I fit into things. I go out there trying to connect us with different groups trying to keep us connected to the big mothership that is Target. Then there's closures. These are people that keep the team together. So this is like my project manager. He's talking to people every day, and I'm talking to him. How's the health of the team? How do people feel? They have lives, too, that impact them. You know, people people get sick. People have frustrations in life. How does that impact work? That's what the closure is doing, is making sure that there's a healthy team environment. Then there's the betweeners. These are much more your lower level people that actually play very critical roles. Because oftentimes people focus on the leadership, but my Hadoop administrators, if they leave, we need to reestablish the connections with the Hadoop administrators on the other teams. And those are very important connections that often get overlooked. And those are the people that are often going to change because as they build their reputation on your team, they're going to become sought after by other people. So how do we sustain all of this? Uh, you know, one story on this, I do have this up here. With all respect to Google, you know, just because it does work at Google doesn't mean it's going to work for you. A uh, great, great example of that is uh, when I started at another company, they had heard that Google has this open floor plan work environment. So they put 100 people in an open floor plan, and that place was nicknamed the pit. It was called that because it was constantly loud, it was a mess, and when anybody got sick, half the team was sick by the end of the week. When they moved those people out of that environment and put them into their own individual spaces, productivity went up, and also the bugs in the code went down, and the turnover also went down. 
So even though it may have worked at Google to have an open space, it did not work with that culture in that organization. You have to remember that what you're creating, it does need to be sustainable, but oftentimes it needs to be customized to your work environment. So some of the pitfalls that uh, you might run into, algorithms. I, I make algorithms uh, primarily uh, for a living. Uh, we, we crank out uh, a couple dozen algorithms every quarter. And one of the things uh, that I always experience is people think, well, algorithms are smart. You read about them doing all these kinds of cool things. Actually, algorithms are quite stupid. You have to feed them data to make them smart. And even then, algorithms are just a collection of assumptions put into a math formula. <coughs> Don't let the algorithm tell you what to do. It can help you make a decision, but you should never just rely on an algorithm to make your decisions for you. And also the data, I, I've heard this constantly, you know, let the data speak the truth. You know, just listen to the data. Again, data can just be garbage in, garbage out. You need to make a, a, a good, solid decision based off your own experience. Is the data trustable? Constantly test your data. Never rely on your data to tell you what to do. You constantly have to test it and always be suspect of it. And the last one is big data and data science, not the same thing. Many companies make this mistake and think that, oh, I'll just put my Hadoop administrators and my data scientists together reporting to the same person. I've been that person. You have to separate the two teams. The skill sets are very different. How they approach the world is very different. A lot of companies would do themselves a big favor if they understood that separation between the two. And then building your roadmap. Your roadmap is your communication piece to the rest of the world. So as uh, Ken Beck says, you know, product uh, roadmaps should be a list of questions, not a list of features. I just finished my roadmap for next year. My first page is nothing but a quest list of questions. What is it that we're trying to build for customers? What's going to be the technology landscape a year from now? What are those new technologies just emerging that are going to break out that we should focus on? How is that going to change the way customers want to shop at different retailers? Is that going to change the mix of the channels that they go for? You have to start thinking about those kind of questions. But the three big questions are the ones that I have up here. Those are the ones that you should start with. And these three, if those are the only three you ask, you probably save yourself 50% of the pain in the process. Is it real? Can you actually do this? Can you win and achieve the goals you want? And is it even worth doing? I have done so many prototypes that never see past the prototype stage because of that last question, where it may work in 50 stores, but when I have to scale the cost to 1,000, it just becomes economically unviable. So just having those three questions alone will save you a lot of headaches. Now, when it comes to building a roadmap, there's never just one roadmap. This is where a lot of uh, people fail when it comes to innovation. You've got to have your ideas and your strategy roadmap. This is your, if I had no restrictions on funding, resources, this is what I would do. That's the first step in your roadmap. The next step Give your team, I usually give them two weeks, which is one sprint schedule for us, to read over it, come over, ask me questions, get some clarification on anything they might not understand. Then you sit down, lock yourself in a conference room for a day or two. Again, lots of sugary drinks and cookies, uh, order some pizza or subs, and whiteboard out and just sort of negotiate out, what can we really do? What's our expected budget? What are our skill sets? What can we really do out of all these great ideas that we know we could do if there was no limits? Then finally, your collaboration roadmap. Because you have to go out and influence other people, you have to figure out, who do I need to talk to? Do I have to go talk to new teams, establish my relationship with old teams? So I got to go out and talk to some vendors that I haven't talked to for six months. So you got to have that, that piece of your roadmap too. When you have all three in place, you've got a really good roadmap that gives you an idea of what you should be doing uh, in your innovation schedule. And a way to communicate that out too, 
because communication is a big thing. So this is actually a road, an actual roadmap that I, I use. This is one that I've been using for years because it's simple. It expresses the idea quickly. I've got research that my team's working on. We take that research, put it into something deliverable, then we operationalize it. And then we take the operational uh, learnings, put that back into delivery, and just keep that process going. It doesn't need to be overly complex. Simplicity ha has a, a beauty in its own that often gets overlooked. I can bring this to pretty much any team in the organization. They look at that, they go, yeah, I get this. This is simple. You don't need to explain it to me. Now, we've been talking a lot about the technology piece of the roadmap. What you also need is the customer uh, experience framing. This is where you go back and understand, what are we doing for the customer here? The thinking, feelings, fears of, of the experience that they're having. What do they see and they hear that's impacting their decision? What do they say and do in that process? Where's the pain points, the gains for them? You gotta answer these questions to help you understand your, your customer. Because a lot of times when you're in this process, you're realizing that customers can't articulate to you exactly what the problem is, but they can give you a good indication of whether or not you're on the right track. And this, this framing uh, does a great job of doing that. So getting to uh, the end here, what's innovation all about? Well, it's reinventing the customer experience. You got a little girl on the track there. She's your customer. She's sitting on the tracks, and a train could come her way. Well, I just created this new track with innovation so that she doesn't have a, an unfortunate accident. That's really what we're, we're doing here. Creating those experiences, getting rid of those pain points, creating new experiences for them. And it's all about connecting the dots for customers. Going back to what is in it for them and what you need to be doing. When I create a product, it's not a technology. I'm creating an emotion. I'm creating a memory. When I create a personalized product for somebody, I can express it as, well, I'm putting data in a Hadoop system that then gets pushed out through an algorithm and comes up as a recommendation engine or a personalized email based off of their purchase history. When I talk to IT, that's what I tell them. When I talk to marketing, I focus on this aspect here. I'm trying to get people to have a positive experience with Target. I want them to think about Target, and they have a good emotional feel about us. When they think about their last purchase with us, it's a positive memory. I'm not talking about the, the marketing piece that goes out, but that, that true emotional aspect that people have when they think about your company. At the end of the day, that's what innovation's about. I'm trying to elicit those emotions and that experience from them. Because at the end of the day, that's what's going to get them to come back and do business with us. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time.